uh, verses 1 through 8. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Before we get started this morning with that scripture in mind, I want to remind you of a love challenge and extend another. Uh, As we mentioned last week, we're collecting for the Woodburn Christian Children's Home. They have an auction each year. This auction is like their main fundraiser. It helps the, the home throughout the year. We always collect and try to buy a large item like a a generator or some large tools uh, that they can auction off and and make money off of. So if you can uh, and you would like to, please give towards that. The box is there at the back and show uh, your love uh, to those children. Our new love challenge deals with our open house. On September 22nd, we plan to have an open house for everyone in the community to come in and and see our facilities and have some fun and some fellowship, get some brochures about our programs and the things we offer here. Uh, We're going to have free food, so we're going to need some food donations. If you'd like to provide some of the food, uh, there's sign-up sheets down at the Welcome Center where you can sign up to provide various things. If you don't want to go to the store, we have another financial need. We're going to have these huge blow-ups for children a bouncy house, and another one that's an obstacle course that's actually three, three huge things in one. Uh, part of the reason we want to get those is to draw people to it, but also so that the children and families can, can have fun with that. But they cost $600 to rent for the day, so if you want to contribute toward those to the co- cost, towards the cost of those, that's needed as well. We also need everyone to plan on coming and helping. Just If you haven't been asked yet, Just show up and we'll get you plugged in and and, and helping. The more people we have around, the more excitement there will be. We're going to have stages throughout the church, uh, or people throughout the church and tour directors and uh, tell about each area and the building and programs and different things. And then uh, we'd also encourage you to keep this in your prayers. Just pray for a great response. And then the final thing, you know, we can have 20 or 25 people probably show up or 50 people show up maybe if we don't do much inviting, but if we really want it to be successful, we need everyone in the church to invite family and friends and neighbors to to come see the church, to come take part. So just want to challenge you to at least get a family member or a a family of people uh, to come and and take the tour and visit. If we do that, we'll probably have over 100 people or maybe even 200 people, and that would be awesome. Um, But the challenge is there. Let's show the community what God has blessed us with, our love for God and our love for them. Well, last week we left off with Saul leaving the wilderness of Arabia. He leaves Arabia and he heads to Jerusalem to begin his ministry. After three years in the desert, Saul has become Paul. And for the rest of his life, he would start churches, he would write a majority of the New Testament, and he would suffer and find contentment. Well, we finish up our sermon series on Paul this morning by noticing that Paul found contentment in the grace of God. Now, we could do another 10 sermons on the churches Paul started and some of the information he shared through the Holy Spirit, but I wanted to finish this series up by noticing while he did all of those things, he suffered, and yet he was content in life. You know, I got hurt a lot when I was younger. I've told you the stories I've shared with you that I got stitches some 12 times. Uh, Stories like when I rolled down the huge hill and the huge cement pipe 
couple of our friends, they were at the top of the hill. We decided to ride them down. I fell out and rolled over my arm. My arm was flat like something off the plant stones. Uh, it took weeks to, to get back to, to normal. I've shared these stories, but uh, the most pain and suffering I've really felt in, in my life was when I was running at 11 o'clock one night and I got hit by a car. Uh, in Virginia, it's hot and humid, so you run early in the morning or you run late at night. I was running about 11 o'clock at night. This car came flying around the curve. It was in the wrong lane. The side mirror of the car hit my, my arm, and it hit me so hard I like spun around and landed down in a ditch, and I messed my hip up. And I was a couple of miles from home, and I, I can remember walking mailbox to mailbox. I would walk to the mailbox, take a break, then try to make it to the nail, next mailbox. Each and every step was painful. It, it, there, there was suffering. You know, sometimes life can be that way. It really can. Every step or every other step seems to bring pain and, and suffering. Let me ask you, have you ever experienced a time of emotional suffering or pain? And you wake up in the morning and for a moment uh, you're okay. But then all of a sudden you remember, and it just comes and wraps itself around you, this pain and, and suffering. It engulfs you. Ever felt that way, experienced that? I imagine a lot of us have. Well, Paul would start churches in Ephesus and Philippi, Galatia, Corinth, Antioch, and he helped start churches in many other places by sending evangelists and with instructions, uh, the Word of God uh, from the Holy Spirit. And as he did these great things for God, Paul continued to suffer. Physically, mentally, emotionally, he would suffer. Remember, God said to Ananias that Saul would do just that. Saul would suffer. It's amazing to realize that the man who was in the forefront when it came to persecution ended up suffering the most from persecution. And while I believe suffering and pain is the, the direct result of sin and Satan, if we had never sinned in that garden, uh, we would still be in the garden living the good life. There would be no pain and, and suffering. So while I think that pain and suffering comes from sin and Satan, I do believe Jesus, God, can use our pain and suffering to improve ourselves, to allow us to improve ourselves, and uh, he'll use it to work for the good. Theologian Helmut uh, Thiel-like, after an extended visit to America, would write this concerning Americans. He would write, they have an inadequate view of suffering. In other words, he thought we really didn't know what it meant to truly suffer. And it's true, compared to the rest of the world, we, we live in luxury. We have every convenience at our fingertips. And maybe we live comfortable lives because we, we do not step out in faith enough. We do not stand up enough. We seek comfort instead of God in life. And we do know this. The Bible says if we're a Christian, we will know suffering. So if we're not suffering in some ways, sacrificing in some ways, then maybe we're not standing up or stepping out quite like we should. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Listen to Paul's words. He writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory, don't miss this, glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to all of us. Now let me ask you, how often do you enjoy or look on the positive side of pain and suffering? And yet Paul calls us to do just that. As Christians, you know, we know how to laugh. And, and that's good. Christ came to bring us joy. As Christians, we know how to fellowship and celebrate and worship. We even know how to debate and argue. Some even know how to grumble, gossip, slander, and fight. However, it seems our lives have to be turned upside down before we groan. 
The Bible says we should groan for the coming of Christ. We should groan for the lost to be saved. We should groan for the church to do more. We should serve to the point we groan. We groan in our worldly sufferings. We don't have a hard time with that. But, but we, should groan. we should serve to the point we groan. We should give to the point we groan. We should put up with another, one another to the point we groan. But do we in those areas, or even in those areas of looking for Christ to come, seeking and saving the lost, doing great things as a church? You know, the apostles understood suffering and groaning. Romans 8, 22 through 23. Paul writes, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, groaning over worldly things. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now, what's the redemption of our bodies? Well, that's when Christ returns or uh, to, to take us to heaven. That's the redemption of the bodies. Our spirit, our soul, as Christians, already belong to him. But we need to groan for that day when heaven's complete, when we're in, when we're in heaven with, with Jesus. In Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, you can feel the emotion of Paul coming off the pages. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-4. through 4. He writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Paul writes here that specific pain, that specific suffering that we have, we can use that to comfort others. We have the Bible that we can use in comforting people when we cannot relate prayer in the Bible, our gifts. But we can also help others in their struggle when we have struggled in the very same way because we can relate. In the first chapter, Paul talks about being so down, so deep in despair, so depressed that he was ready to be done on earth. Chapter 1, verse 8 shares this, and Paul goes on to say, God held him together. Now let me ask you, ever felt that way? Where the only thing keeping you alive is pretty much God holding you together. I know I have. Then he writes, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 11, about some of this worldly pain and suffering. We are hard-pressed on every side, he writes, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that this life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Paul faced adversity, affliction. He was persecuted. but He wasn't crushed. He, uh, he fell. He was pushed down, but he wasn't destroyed. Pain and suffering. And then we find Paul writing this in, in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, he writes, Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Again, more suffering, more, more pain. I, mean, I, I hope you truly ask yourself this morning, when was the last time I suffered for the sake of Christ? Because every apostle... Every follower of Christ, you can feel the suffering come off the pages of the Bible. And then Paul writes these amazing words in chapter 11, beginning with verse 22. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And then he writes, I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I'm more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pull, pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Even in the church, I was in danger. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. 
Uh, now, can you hear a little bit of groaning here for, for the worldly stuff, the suffering? I mean, listen to the, the suffering here. Misunderstood. Have you ever been misunderstood? Uh, what you're trying to say, what you're trying to do gets misunderstood. Uh, ever been mistreated? The word mistreated. We've, we've all been there. Forsaken and forgotten, that's a deep, a deep in your heart type of suffering. Abuse, many have suffered abuse and, and, and you know what that suffering brings. Then, then he writes, maligned, shipwrecked three times, attacked, stoned, starved to death, you know, just about starved to death, imprisoned, left for dead, hungry and naked, left for dead. You know, this week we saw suffering as Hurricane Doran pressed down on the East Coast. However, sometimes we bring suffering upon ourselves, do we not? Uh, this Jeep is parked on the sands of Myrtle Beach. and I, I got the rest of the story this morning. Someone actually borrowed this car from their family so they could drive down to the ocean, take pictures of the storm coming in. Instead of parking in the parking lot, they pulled all the way down on the beach, took too many pictures, and suddenly their car was five feet underwater and it was too late to get the car out. You know, sometimes we kind of bring it on ourselves, do we not? The pain and suffering. Uh, that Jeep should have been headed west on a highway, all right? Not sitting on the beach with the storm coming in. We invite suffering. But Paul's suffering, it wasn't invited. He wasn't doing foolish things. He wasn't, spre he, he wasn't spreading foolishness. He was spreading the gospel. He was sp spreading salvation. He was being attacked by Satan and those Satan was using to try to oppress and destroy the New Testament church. And notice Paul says, I do not wish to boast in my ability to, to endure. I boast in my weaknesses. Often, we like to do the opposite, do we not? We like to talk about how the world is mistreating us. Ever heard someone say, it seems like the whole world's against me. Everything. Work's not going well. A relationship's not going well. My neighbors are rude. My family irritates me. My left pinky toe always hurts. You know, the whole world is after you. And we go on and on and on about our suffering. We, we boast in it. One thing I've noticed is that most people who really have something to complain about, most people who are really suffering, they rarely share their stories of suffering. They rarely even complain. Paul shares next something we touched on last week, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2. He writes, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Now this is a, a remarkable passage of Scripture. Rather than explain the unexplainable, Paul says he simply does not know. This intellectually gifted man says, I don't know. But notice four things about this, this passage. Paul's writing about John's revelations here. And notice, he, he writes about it and shares it because John had experienced it himself. He could write about it because John had experienced it. Second, uh, he shares, didn't know sir, for sure of his location or the orientation, but... He calls it the third heaven and later paradise. But he says he doesn't know if John was in the body or out of the body. Somehow he went beyond this earth he shares and experienced God. This experience happened suddenly, he says. He says he was caught up like a rapture. Uh, it was swift, not gradual. He suddenly found himself, in other words, John did, in the presence of God. And fourth, what he heard and experienced, he could not put into words. Though he knew what he had seen... He could not put it into human expression. Again, God was preparing Paul by being around John, by sharing with this experience for, for great things. Now, after being chosen to witness these things, John did some great things. After being chosen to hear these things, be around this, uh, John, uh, it certainly took Paul's level to, to, a, new, to, to a new high. The Holy Spirit was being given to him. These revelations were being shared with him. So he could have got puffed up. He could have had some pride. Uh, when I was in my late 30s, I got a notice that I'd been selected to be in the who's who book uh, of young leaders in America under the age of 40. 
Well, I remember being so excited about that. I've been selected, recognized. I told my family and friends, was a little bit boastful about it. But then I found out it really wasn't that hard to get into. In fact, I learned they make the books and put you in them so that you'll spend $100 and buy the book, all right? You know, pride can puff us up. And pride could have puffed up John. Pride could have puffed up Paul. Um, but reality can humble us. Well, God does not allow Paul uh, to get puffed up throughout his ministry. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So Paul knew this thorn would ensure his humble spirit. The word here for thorn comes from the Greek word scallops, and it means sharply pointed stake. Paul is saying here, he was given a stake in the flesh. Now, what was this thorn? What was this stake in the flesh? Well, the answer to that question is, we do not know. Now, many people have speculated. They've suggested spiritual temptations, physical temptations, uh, relentless obstacles, persecution, uh, epilepsy, migraines, chronic eye trouble, hunchback, reoccurring bouts with malaria, and he probably experienced some of those because of the beatings he took. But he kind of sounds like, in their suggestions, you know, the side effects guy from a new medication, you know, all those different things. People have speculated, but the truth is we don't know the thorn, we don't know the stake that was in his flesh. Paul calls it a messenger of Satan. The devil hoped to use it to lead Paul away from the faith. God used it to keep the gifted servant on his knees. Sailors, I'm told, who find themselves in a storm do one thing when they are not doing a necessary task. Uh, they secure themselves to something on the ship. Uh, they grab a hold of something. Paul would have this thorn in his flesh, this earthly storm, continually in his life. And he would continually grab hold of God, hold on to God, even in the roughest roughest times in the storm. But know this, Paul did not like suffering. No one does. He did not want this thorn in the flesh. He did not want us to suffer. He didn't want to be persecuted in the ways that he was. He just knew he had great reason to endure it. He would go on to write in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away, this thorn in the flesh, this stake in the flesh. Take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Power, did you notice, is perfected in what? Weaknesses. That's quite a statement, quite a reality. It's also why we suffer sometimes. We may not find healing. We may continue to suffer. We may not understand God, but, but God, we may not understand what is going on in our life, but God says what? He says to us, my grace is sufficient. It's enough. Power is perfected in weakness. You know, when it comes down to it, life really isn't about us. It's about God. His weaknesses are stronger than our greatest strengths. It's not about this life or this body. Life is about relationship with the highest. Life is about eternal life. Life on earth is where we establish through Christ where we will spend eternal life. So may we realize like Paul that it doesn't matter what we face. It's about finding contentment in God regardless of what we face. So like we've done throughout this series, let's take some lessons home with us after noticing the sufferings of Paul and again, like, like it has been, these will be quick. Lesson number one, suffering is not new. We're not the first to suffer. Remember Job? He suffered in just about every way. Well, Job was way back in the Old Testament. You can read Job 5, 7. It says, yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Jesus would say sometime later, in this world, there will be trouble. When suffering comes, do not blame or question God. Expect it and then cling to Him. 
Grab a hold of God. Abraham, Job, Noah, Moses, Samson, David, Peter, John, Paul, and the list could go on and on. They all suffered. However, they also held on to God. We're not the first to know pain and suffering. We can endure, be content, and grow just like they did. Lesson number two, suffering plays a beneficial role. Sometimes we suffer because of something or someone. And often this can consume us instead of help us. Someone does something to us and we find it hard not to hate. We have the ability, the freedom to choose love or hate and we just want to choose hate. We want to choose bitterness instead of forgiveness. However, maybe instead of being consumed by it and making those bad choices, maybe instead of letting our hearts go to dark places, we should simply, and it might take time and time again, say to ourselves as a Christian, how am I going to grow from this? How am I going to respond from this? How am I going to choose love over hate in this? If we do not take the opportunity to grow, even in the bad situations of life, we will take away the benefit and the suffering will never go away. Lesson number three, contentment is not comfort. I think we get those confused. We think we can be content through Christ, so that means we can be comfortable through Christ. But Paul was very rarely comfortable. Right? Contentment is not comfort. Paul would write later, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. He would write, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it's, it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, don't miss that. He was content when he was uh, experiencing plenty, but he was also content when? When he was in want. He was wanting to feel better. He was wanting to eat. He was wanting to be rescued, but he was still content. Paul knew what it meant to suffer, but he did not allow it to keep him from contentment through Jesus Christ. Someone once said, God's best deliveries often come through the back door. Uh, we might not always be comfortable, but we can keep our joy and contentment. This comes from the grace of God that is sufficient for all of us. Well, I want to finish up this morning with a poem. I, I believe I've shared this uh, poem before. It's one of my favorites, and, and it points to how we react to life. The author writes, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am, among all men, most richly blessed. That poem was written by a Confederate soldier, a soldier experiencing pain and suffering, a soldier at war. May those words ring true in our hearts. I believe they would have been found in, in the heart of the Apostle Paul. So throughout this series, the lessons learned from the Apostle Paul, may we be sure we're on the right road. May we allow God to use us to do great things for Him. May we go deep with God. And we, may we find contentment, purpose, and joy in this life, even in times of pain and suffering. May we fix our eyes, as Paul did, on Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. As the worship leaders come this morning, if you have a decision to make, I just encourage you to come as we all stand and sing. Let's stand and sing together.